Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Pediatric Grand Rounds. Um, the usual reminders from me before we get started. Please stay muted during the presentations. If you have questions or comments at any time, please enter them into the chat with everyone box, and we will share your questions and comments with the speaker during the Q&A. You'll be getting an evaluation from our team by email. Please make sure to fill that out for us. And finally, the planners for Grand Rounds have no relevant financial relationships to disclose. And um, now I will turn things over to Dr. Crystal Perez, who will introduce our fabulous speaker for today. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Suzanne. I'm really excited um, to introduce Jonathan, uh, Dr. Jonathan V. Posner. He's a Richard and Victoria Harrington Professor for Engineering, Innovation, and Health in Mechanical Engineering, a Chemical Engineering, and is an adjunct professor in the Department of Family Medicine at the University of Washington. He's a founder and the director of UW's Engineering, Innovation, and Health Program, which is amazing, uh, and I encourage everyone to get involved with that. It focuses on developing technical solutions to pressing challenges in health and healthcare. Um, his re research group works on diverse set of need-driven research projects that includes a point of care in vitro diagnostics for infectious diseases, medical devices, improved cook stoves for the developing world, which is close to my heart, and helmets that reduce the risk of concussion. He's founded two companies, Vicis, focused on a football helmet, reducing the risk of concussion, and Farisa, focused on point of care diagnostics. It's not surprising that he's he was UW Medicine's Inventor of the Year in 2016. So with that, I'll pass it over um, to you, Jonathan. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for the kind introduction, Crystal, and Leslie for the invitation, and Emily for all the coordination. It's uh, it's really an honor to uh, get to speak to you all and tell you more about uh, what we're doing um, just in your neighborhood here at UW on developing um, innovative um, medical devices to solve um, challenges here. Let me see if I can get my PowerPoint on and hopefully everybody can see that clearly. Um, yeah, so the focus of my talk today is really gonna be on opportunities uh, for the folks that are delivering uh, clinical care uh, um, for health innovation in the area of pediatrics. Um, I wanna just start off by disclosing um, my own personal work uh, and for consulting as well as um, different companies that are supporting the engineering innovation and health program. The um, engineering innovation health program has been around for uh, this is our ninth year, so we'll be se celebrating our um, 10 year anniversary next year. And so I'm going to give a flavor of sort of how we do design and how we work with folks and uh, some examples of projects that we've worked on in the hope that it might inspire you to get engaged uh, with us or some way, uh, in another way on innovating in health. So the mission of the program is to develop uh, innovative and accessible solutions to challenges in human health. And one of the important thing we do is we form teams and that those teams are really formed around the clinical problem and the clinical partner, which would be folks like Crystal and, 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 um, and Greg Valentine and Kenneth Gao and the very large number of people that we've worked with at Seattle Children's Hospital. We train students. We also offer some training to the clinical partners, and we're we're creating a team, an interdisciplinary team around a, a clinical challenge. So, some interesting history around sort of medical innovation and technology. The oldest known record that I could find was something about a thousand years before uh, Christ is a prosthetic toe. Um, um, in, in Egypt, um, they, they found a prosthetic toe. So that's the first example that I could find. There may be others. Uh, of course, the stethoscope came um, early in the 19th century. Um, the, uh, the first use of, of anesthetic was uh, before 1850. Um, and x-ray, of course, and uh, a big one in 1895. More recently, uh, sort of during the World War II period, uh, during the occup occupation in, in the Netherlands, um, dialysis was developed um, with uh, basically like tin cans and some tubs for washing clothes. And then right here in our in our back court, uh, Wayne Quinton and the Belding Scribner developed um, the dialysis shunt. So uh, Seattle actually has a very rich history of uh, medical device innovation. Um, and so this is a great place uh, where you have very strong um, engineering and, and technical programs at UW and the surrounding area, as well as, of course, UW Medicine and Seattle Children's and just a really strong um, um, medical community here. 
So one of the questions that I want to try to answer for you all is uh, how best to start a health innovation uh, project. And uh, hopefully by the end of it, um, I'll, I'll have some answers to that on some pathways to, to do that. So I want to talk a little bit about design, and uh, we have a very strong design philosophy in engineering innovation and health, and um, there's different ways to do design. One of them is called an act of insight, and um, this is kind of a famous story for an everyday invention that all of you are familiar with, and um, this is a not a real picture, but uh, of this individual, a Swiss engineer named uh, George de Mestrel, and uh, he was hiking, the story goes that he was hiking with his dog and his uh, dog was picking up these uh, little burrs on, on his fur. Uh, they're called cockle burrs. And if you look very closely at these spikes, uh, the cockle burrs, you'll see these little hooks. And so the famous story about this invention is that this engineer was walking, saw these cockle burrs and says, you know, how can I uh, use uh, this effect of being so sticky on my dog's fur because it takes me hours to remove these. And uh, this eventually became the invention that we know as Velcro. And if you look very closely at Velcro, you'll see that it very closely follows this uh, cockle burr uh, geometry where these two ends get sticky together. So this is one way of, of innovation and design and recognition of seeing something in nature and seeing that it's useful and trying to repurpose it uh, for some other um, application. Another kind of design philosophy is what's called the technology push and Apple and many other technology companies are um, are uh, kind of famous for this kind of thing where they'll create something that is magnificent. They're not exactly sure what the purpose will be, but they uh, it will become useful. And uh, I really like this cartoon because uh, I am kind of an Apple fanboy. I like the iPad. I find it very useful, but it's maybe not something that people need it. Um, but but it's something that's very useful. The um, engineering innovation and health program takes a, a different approach, um, what we call a need-based design or human-centered design. And the I think a good example of that is uh, that of a celestial navigation in, in the 16th century. Um, until that point, navigation uh, at sea was based on astronomical observations. And I'm quite the sailor myself, and so this is an interesting story to me if you haven't heard of the book called Longitude, um, it's a good read. But um, at that time in the 16th century, uh, latitude was determined by the backstaff, and you can um, measure that quite accurately. But longitude was much more difficult to measure, and essentially it was measured by what's called dead reckoning. So you know where you started, and if you know roughly how fast you're going and how long you were going that fast, you could use tables and charts and so forth to figure out what you, what you where you were. But uh, people were running aground, you know, when they were trying to go to um, India, they ended up in, in the New World. And, and so, you know, things are were very difficult as far as navigation goes. And nothing was uh, wanted more than uh, the ability to determine longitude uh, to travel. And so because this is such a, a big challenge, um, the in 1714, the British government um, enacted the Longitudinal Act, which is essentially a 20,000 uh, pound prize for anyone that could determine longitude within a half a degree, which is essentially equivalent if you convert that into time, about two minutes of time. And so there were clocks, of course, at that time, but there were pendulum clocks and they didn't work well on a boat that was rocking back and forth. And so um, this prize went out and John Harrison, who was a carpenter and just repaired large clocks, developed basically a spring powered clock, which is you know, much more modern version of, of a timepiece now. And uh, through sort of over 40 years, he developed a series of what are called marine chronometers, which are basically just watches that work off springs and uh, that were very, were able to very accurately uh, measure uh, time. And if you're ever in London, in that area, you can go to Greenwich, which is, you know, a few miles east of London and, you know, go check out the Meridian Line where the Greenwich Mean Time is defined. But they have a great museum there of all these marine chronometers, which essentially made sea travel more accurate and, and really possible in that period. Because, and the point of the story here is that people didn't say, well, you know, this type of watch would, would was just good and people are going to want it and put it in their pocket. The point here was that they needed it to travel. And so this design was based on that need and very specific for that need. 
And so that's the kind of approach that we use um, in our program, which we call a human or need centered design. And this is a graphic from Stanford D School, where a lot of our philosophy comes from. A lot of the people that teach in our program uh, spent time at Stanford. And it has these different, these five different phases of sort of empathize, really understand what is the problem and the people that you're trying to, to help define very clearly, define that problem, ideate, come up with some kinds of solutions, prototype, develop those solutions, and then test them. And this is not drawn as a linear line because really there's a lot of iteration loops where you're going to prototype and then realize you don't really understand your patient population or the people, you know, the clinicians that are going to use the technology. So if you, if you go on the internet and you try to look up medical innovation, you'll find various graphics of circles and straight lines. And this is one set example of, of how these things work, how they're funded and the different phases. So you kind of start off with some basic research or some technology development, and often those are funded uh, by internal grants or by federal grants. And uh, then you you develop a prototype and you, you think about its feasibility for working in, in, in the health field. You might have some type of preclinical study. Maybe this is a lab-based study. Maybe it's a simulation. You know, um, it, may be, it could be an animal study. Then you would do a more formal sort of uh, quality systems product development and then, and then a clinical study and routine clinical use. And there's different funding mechanisms and requirements for FDA filing and so forth in these things. I, my intention is not to really go into detail on this, except to say that often you all might be working with industry on sort of this later phase here where they have a prototype, they want to put it in humans, and it's going to go to some type of research hospital to evaluate that, perhaps funded by the NIH or some large industry grants. Where the EIH program sits is really on this early phase. So, you know, what is worth working on? Um, what does that invention look like? How does it work? How does it meet the needs? And so where all of you who are um, delivering healthcare and, and working in clinic fit in here is uh, identifying and bringing those needs uh, to the surface. So um, the way that we view the role of clinician is really, well, you're practicing medicine and working with patients every day and what's not working for you? Um, how are your patients uh, perhaps not getting equitable care? Perhaps um, the devices and the methods that you're using are not effective. And so bringing that to the program and engaging in partnership um, with engineers and scientists to try to uh, understand uh, and empathize around the need and then develop uh, working solutions to that. And so the program is really about understanding that need, developing a prototype or a process, developing an intellectual property, and really ultimately the preliminary data that's needed for publications and grant applications and furthering these things into commercialization and ultimate use in the hospital environment. So the answer, sort of the question is, how do I start a health innovation project? I like to think of the answer for all of you is today in your clinical environment by observing what's going on and identifying uh, what we call unmet needs. And so what is what is worth solving? Uh, what is worth addressing? Because there's a limited amount of time. Of course, there's probably an endless list of, of challenges in, in working in healthcare. But what is solvable and what's worth solving? And so that's kind of the main question for uh, clinical folks that that um, interact with our program. We ask them to think about that and ultimately kind of submit their ideas uh, to our program. So I think the best way to kind of tell you about what we do is to give you some uh, some examples. And so this is a team uh, from several years ago in the Engineering Innovation and Health Program uh, that was uh, led by Taylor Sawyer, a uh, pediatrician and a neonatologist. Uh, and um, the, he had a team of engineers, interdisciplinary engineers. I believe they were mechanical engineers, chemical engineers, and perhaps one electrical engineer. Um, and this project is still ongoing uh, in, in development. And so the problem that Taylor brought to us is that of the 4 million uh, babies that are born uh, every year, that about 10% of them require oxygen uh, after birth. And of those 10%, uh, about 1 in 500 require intubation. So that's uh, equivalent to roughly about uh, 8,000 babies per year are requiring intubation uh, after they're born. And I believe these are just um, numbers in the United States. Um, 
and uh, he sh brought this cartoon to us. I don't mean to poke fun at at uh, in debating, uh, you know, a, a neonate, but he brought this cartoon to us and saying, you know, when you're training uh, residents and 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 people that um, don't get to intubate um, these neonates very often, these small, you know, one and two kilogram babies, it's very challenging. Also, because the frequency of it may not be that high. Of course, in our region, maybe a lot of these high risk pregnancies come to our region, so it's maybe more often, but you it's it's a very nerve-wracking uh, process because uh of course oxygen very important um to sustain life and uh, you have a very small window to perform this uh, life-saving procedure so when we looked at the research what we saw was that uh, for attending physicians the success the first time success rate was was uh, 70 percent which is i would say rather high uh, for intubating um, uh, neonates. But when you look uh, at the folks that are earlier in their career, residents or first year fellows, the uh, intubation success rate is was much lower, less than half and less than 25% uh, for, for residents, as would be expected for these individuals with, with less training. So, uh, you know, with these success rates uh, with direct uh, laryngoscopy, uh, being less than 20% in residents and 70% and for highly trained um, specialists. Uh, the challenge there was that there is the risk of severe oxygen desaturation over 50% of the time and a cardiac arrest uh, in 20% in uh, of these intubation attempts. So, um, and, and repeated intubation attempts, which is what someone would do if they were not successful the first time, perhaps, um, there was risk of hemorrhage and brachycardia and uh, other potential for, for damage. And so, uh, of course, the other option might be uh, laryngeal mask airway, which is uh, can be quite effective. Uh, but uh, what Taylor brought to the program was saying, uh, although that they're effective, they're not really secure. And so uh, for a long-term airway, um, not that effective. And so the need statement, which is kind of a core tenant of our program, which is a single sentence that really tries to sum up what the challenge is. Um, the need statement for this project was a method for safely and consistently intubating neonates resulting in a secure and long-term airway. Uh, one of the key insights of this project was that um, the intubation rates um, for training for, for individuals that were training, so residents and fellows and so forth, were much higher if there was no time pressure. So if they were not under the 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 time pressure and the and the um, concern for doing it very quickly and doing it right the first time, the success rates went up dramatically. And so this was a very key insight because what it said to us is if somehow we could give more time, uh, allow them uh, multiple attempts, that the success rate would be uh, much higher. And so the concept for this project is what's called an intubating LMA, and it's not a completely new concept. But for pediatrics and for this kind of scenario, for this kind of condition, um, it it, um, it it can be very um, useful a solution. So essentially, it's an LMA that can be inserted immediately and deliver oxygen uh, to the baby. Uh, you have a video camera there so that you can see uh, the position of everything. And then you can directly um, connect it to a ventilator uh, to deliver oxygen and, and, and get the oxygen levels where you need it. And then once things were stable, you could then intubate and remove the LMA. And so um, the features here are kind of pointed out, but it has a soft cuff. It has a video camera, kind of a rigid body LMA, and then a track for the endotracheal tube. Perhaps the best way to understand this is just to see a video of it working. So this is uh, Stefan Falstone that is performing this. He's an engineering student, an undergraduate. Um, you know, uh, this is a little um, simulated baby here that Taylor's team let us borrow. And you can see the device in his hand. It's a black device. You can see the camera there sort of at the end. And he has a video camera that's sitting right next to the baby. So the first stage here is uh, to insert the LMA. Oop, let me go back here. I meant to stop the video. The first step here is to insert the LMA, and you can see the, uh, oops, I cannot stop this video. Hold on a second. Let me see if I can try one more time. No, I can't do it. Okay. So um, the uh, the first step here is to uh, is to put it in, and you can see actually in the video the 
the entrance to the trachea right there. Normally, you'd be delivering oxygen and just waiting for the levels to increase. When you're ready to intubate, then you would slide the intubation tube in. And what's unique about this design is that you can actually remove the LMA, and then you have a secure airway. And you can see, I mean, this is done, of course, on a mannequin, and uh, it's uh, done by an engineering student. But it's very simple to operate. And, and the real value to this is that you're just not in a rush to intubate. You could have the LMA in there, stabilize, and then when you're ready, or perhaps someone with a higher level of experience can come in and actually do the intubation. And so, as I said, this project is ongoing. Um, it recently was awarded a couple hundred thousand dollars from the ReReach program. And uh, prototype is being developed under um, what's called a quality system. So that's a requirement for a design process um, for FDA submission. So this is well on its way to commercialization and, of course, probably needs a lot more steps and some more funding. But it's a very exciting project that Taylor has stuck, uh, stuck through for more than five years. So another project I'm going to talk about is uh, called Detect IV. Um, it's led by Greg Valentine. So uh, Greg and and uh, Crystal Perez uh, have been very involved in the IH program. Um, Greg also serves on our advisory board, um, and uh, they have both led um, several successful projects, uh, really focusing on uh, low and middle income countries and global health, and uh, developing uh, medical innovation for that space. So um, it's kind of a new uh, new and growing area for our program, and just really happy to have both Greg and Crystal. Um, I, this project uh, that started last year uh, was brought to us by Greg, and uh, he has a great team of engineers, including uh, Kathleen Kearney, who is currently the teaching assistant for the program and continues to work on this project. And so the, the challenge there was intravenous infiltration. Um, and so I'm sure you're all aware of this, but um, these catheters that are uh, um, inserted here um, can potentially leak and cause an infiltration event. And so that you get a buildup of saline in the tissue that can uh, that can pool and cause damage. And so um, this is uh, this can happen anywhere in the world, of course, but it is substantially worse in understaffed clinics in low and middle income countries. Um, there's a stat here. I don't, I don't have the reference for it um, that nine out of 10 peripheral IVs will be complicated in some way by infiltration. And this can cause very serious uh, issues um, from anywhere from tissue damage uh, to necrosis to amputation, really all the way um, to um, to death. And so um, in the U.S., I'm sure these things are, are monitored. It does happen, but they're probably caught at a stage where they, they can be addressed uh, without too much concern. But in low middle income countries, this can be a, a very serious um, a harm to the patients if not monitored closely. So the need statement for this project is a way to prevent tissue necrosis, limb loss, and death caused by undetected IV infiltration in newborns, especially in understaffed and under-resourced settings, and, um, and uh, that this can be prevented by early detection of infiltration. And the solution is pretty close uh, using technology that's pretty close to what's used now which is really focusing on leveraging existing tagoderm patches used on IV catheters. And so the, the main two measures in which this team identified was to um, identify um, symptoms of leakage, which um, of infiltration, which number one would be some type of leakage and or swelling of the site. <clears throat> and so uh, detect IV uh, essentially does those two things. I, it's going to detect swelling, which is sort of on this upper uh, right-hand graphic, and then also leakage. Um, and so these would be shown in two different visual indications. There is some technology for doing this electronically, which has an alarm and its own screen. Um, in my own experience working in the clinical environment, I have seen a, a lot of alarms, and I know that there's quite a bit of noise and alarm fatigue. But I like this solution because um, a very quick observation of anyone working on the floor could see that there's a problem here. And it has the potential of having a really low cost because um, it's really just, you know, part of that existing patch and uh, hopefully could be <clears throat> distributed uh, around the world. So their prototype solution is working quite well. Um, the one on the left is showing uh, the very left hand picture that says no swelling. 
is a picture of a, a of just a normal tissue that's not swollen, an IV site. But as uh, this site begins to swell, then instead of seeing one circle, you start to see a two circle. So this is kind of like a moye pattern, which amplifies um, any disturbance, um, any uh, motion in the surface. And the leakage detection is done with a dye. And so they've tested this both on artificial skin as well as a pig skin and seen uh, very good results of, of this kind of blue dye that comes out when, whenever there's leakage. So if you have questions, I'll leave it to Greg to answer. But this is a very exciting low cost solution for detecting um, IV infiltration. So uh, the problem is that uh, I could probably talk about uh, two dozen projects that have been led by uh, folks working with the pediatric population and spe specifically uh, Seattle Children's. We've had a lot of great mentors. Um, one of our uh, strongest uh, mentors that have come back many times is Kenneth Gao. Um, he always submits projects and has been a, a great mentor to the team. Um, Randy Bly has submitted a lot of projects, um, and uh, he's also on an advisory board. Of course, I mentioned Crystal, but there's a lot of others in urology and anesthesia and um, a lot of different fields that have uh, brought problems to us. And I list a few here, uh, but there's really, if I listed everyone, there there wouldn't be enough space. And I think we have three projects uh, this year out of nine that are affiliated uh, with Seattle Children's. Um, so it's really exciting to to work with this uh, with with this group of folks. Um, I do, do want to mention Chuck Magnus's name. Um, I think his official title at Seattle Children's is Innovation Architect. So that probably means that he does a lot of different things. But he's a close partner of the EIH program, and I think um, a good uh, place uh, for all of you to reach out. If you're if you're thinking about innovation or you have novel ideas or you have something that you want to try to protect, it's intellectual property. He's always a good guy to reach out to. And whenever we get a Seattle Children's project, uh, we always let Chuck know about it um, so that he can uh, lead things on on that end. So I did want to tell you a little bit more kind of about the structure of the EIH program in case that you are interested in participating. Um, it's a it's kind of a, a year long program and right now we just celebrated our symposium and the students just revealed all of their projects and what we're doing in the summer is in is really trying to coordinate and partner with clinical folks like yourselves to get projects on un, essentially unmet needs we're less interested in i have this great idea and i want you to make it that's not really what our program is about you could have something in mind but what we really want to hear from you is about your unmet needs, your unmet challenges, problems that you want to solve. And you may have a really good idea of how to solve it, and that's great. And that will come into play. But really what we want to hear from you at first is what is that challenge that needs to be solved? What is the current ways in which you that you may currently address the problem? What other technologies are being considered or tried? But uh, perhaps there's no real uh, firm solution for that. In the fall, we assemble about 75 students that are from across the College of Engineering. Um, so they're coming from uh, mechanical engineering, chemical engineering, material science, bioengineering, um, electrical, um, computer science, and so forth. And uh, we, we assemble these 75 students and we um, have them assemble in teams around your unmet need. And so you essentially will be a partner in the program. You'll tell the students about your uh, your your challenge. If it's possible, you might invite them in the clinic to observe firsthand, but really trying to understand, you know, what is the patient population affected? How serious is the impact? What are the what are the numbers? What are the what are the uh, the negative impacts, the numbers of deaths or negative conditions that result? Um, and they'll try to understand the market and the real opportunity there. And, and so the fall program is not really about building anything. It's about really understanding the problem and thinking about what is the solution space, what is possible. In the winter and spring, um, sort of half the projects uh, no longer exist after the fall. We, we think they're really interesting projects, but some become much more compelling. Some of the clinicians are much more engaged and some of the students uh, are, are really dedicated to this process and others are not so much. Um, and so we do have a process in which some of the projects are, are eliminated. And then in the winter and spring, uh, the prototypes are developed. Um, patents are submitted, um, data is taken on, uh, on, on prototypes, 
um, and um, students really understand how is this device going to be regulated, what is the market for the device, and so forth. And the program culminates in the spring with a big symposium, which we just had uh, Tuesday. And then beyond, uh, lots of things can happen. Uh, grants can be written, um, funding, um, local funding from WRF or Comotion or Seattle Children's, um, we reach ITHS. There's a lot of local funding, um, but also you can write grants to NIH and DOD and, and potentially uh, even spin out a startup company. So a lot of different things can come out of the program. But at the end of it, what you really have is a, a core team of both technical folks uh, and, and folks from the clinical side that are working together to solve a health, uh, a health challenge. Um, there's a lot of different people that are involved in our program. We have about five or six different um, engineering faculty. Um, you've got students from a broad range of, of engineering majors, but also you get students from business and anthropology and economics and physics and biochemistry. You get a really wide range of students involved. Um, from the clinical side, um, you know, it's not just MDs. We get a lot of um, nurses, uh, nurse practitioner, physician assistants, uh, even health administrators that submit projects or become part of the team. So even though uh, you may submit a project, you may find that you need to bring other members of your team into the project to really help understand the project and make sure that it's meeting everyone's needs. We also have folks from industry, retired and ongoing folks from industry that participate in the process. Um, we have business folks, experienced business leaders that may come in to help lead projects or direct the teams um, as far as uh, what's the market opportunity and the business opportunity. And then we have lots of other experts, uh, subject matter experts, uh, regulatory, intellectual property, reimbursement, and so on and so forth. So it's a really um, a great community uh, of folks uh, to, to start these kinds of projects. In the past nine years, we've really grown a lot with the type of uh, partners that we've worked with. Of course, um, we have a lot of expert advisors. We're very connected to the UW ecosystem. Uh, we have funding from uh, different foundations like the Herbert B. Jones Foundations and VentureWell, working with a lot of different uh, industry partners. Um, and as well as, of course, the core of, of what everything we do is the clinical institution. So do a lot of work, of course, with UW Medical Center, with you all at Seattle Children's, um, have had a lot of work being done at Harborview um, in dentistry and nursing um, and in places uh, far away as Idaho and Alaska. And really a new area that we want to really grow in is working with folks um, in, in global health. So in low and middle income countries is an area that we really like to grow in the future. We've had uh, over the past nine years, over 500 students enrolled, uh, hundreds of clinical partners. Uh, lots of patent applications, uh, over 120 projects, uh, nine departments in UW uh, represented through students, and, and quite a large number, over a dozen projects that are in the early stage of, of commercialization. So kind of the message that I want to try to leave you with uh, is the, sort of the value of engaging with engineering innovation and health for you all as the clinicians. And one is to really develop and translate an unmet need into some type of innovative uh, working solution. And so it's a long road to get this thing into clinical care, but uh, it's sort of a nine months of engagement with our program, um, sort of on the order of uh, maybe an hour uh, a, week, a week of engagement to, to really take a first step forward uh, to, to getting a working solution to a problem. I think the other perhaps most important part of our program is the forming of an interdisciplinary team around your need. And I, and I think you will find it really gratifying to work with folks in engineering um, and, uh, and, and uh, intellectually stimulating to work with around regulatory issues and hospital administrators and other things around really understanding your problem from a holistic way and um, thinking about what kinds of solutions may be useful. So when you leave the program, you'll really have a very strong team and Crystal and Greg and, and Kenneth Gao and Randy, if you talk to them, I think they'll be um, speak fondly about the teams that they developed through EIH. And we get a lot of repeat customers because of um, the development of these teams and the strong bond that's created. 
you also get the opportunity to really learn more about health entrepreneurship and, and innovation, um, regulatory, uh, benchmarking, intellectual property, how these things are funded and spun out. So if that's interesting to you, this is really a great place to learn that process and to go through it in sort of a comfortable environment. And the last one is that it's really a first step to working on health innovation. Um, you may be interested in commercialization or you may be more interested in research. But this will give you a preliminary uh, a prototype device and preliminary data that will be needed for writing papers, um, submitting grants, uh, submitting um, uh, patents, um, and also potentially if you're interested, even spinning out a company. So the next uh, big stage uh, or, or strategic direction for the engineering innovation and health program is health equity. Uh, we've been taking projects around this broad area of health equity really for the past nine years, even from the first year that we started the program. But um, in the next decade of the program, we, we really want to double down on this strategic focus. And um, we are broadly interpreting this term of health equity to really encompass anyone uh, that is uh, defined as perhaps underserved or, or a vulnerable population. And that, that that may be for a variety of reasons. It could be socioeconomic status or race or ethnicity, at age, which in your case, you know, you're working with pediatric patients. And I think you're probably uh, acutely aware that there's a lot of technology that's developed for adults and it's just not available for pediatric patients. And so part of what we want to do in our program is try to level the playing field, but um, also in geography. So um, there's a lot of challenges in, in delivering rural uh, health care as well as um, working in low and middle income countries. So. Um, this is what we want to do for the next 10 years, and I view um, you all at Seattle Children's as uh, key, partners, uh, key partners in in making this possible to identify and, and help develop solutions to unmet needs in, in pediatric um, care. So um, that's kind of the conclusion of what I had to say. Um, if you are interested in, in, in opportunities to improve the lives of your patients and, and you want to do that through innovation, then please uh, reach out to work with us. Um, there's our website. It's eih.uw.edu. There's my email. And if you go to that website, there's a little tab at the top that says clinicians. And if you link on that, it'll say something like submit unmet need. And that's really where it starts. It's a one page thing. Um, with your deep understanding of an unmet need, it probably will take 10 minutes of time. And then we'll just follow up with you. So it's a really kind of low barrier first step. And I uh, hope you'll take some time to um, uh, you know, look around in your clinical environment and think deeply about, you know, what are the most pressing challenges to solve? So with that, I'll conclude and be happy to answer any questions that, that you may have. Thank you so much. And while we wait for questions, I'll just say thank you. This is really, really cool work. So we really appreciate you being here. And I'll be quiet and look to the chat. Also, if um, our viewers feel brave enough to unmute, you can ask your question live. Hello, it's uh, Leslie Walker Hardy. Thank you so much for coming. I was very excited uh, for you to come and present today. You know what I'm wondering, um, and this is really great. Uh, it, when somebody, you know, we have a lot of people here who may not have um, thought about problems they see every day and how to, mm -hmm. you know, actually connect and um, make a difference with them. How would you uh, suggest? Uh, should people just try to reach out to you or i mean you have this idea something's constantly bothering you about what you have to do every day or you know right. you feel so um how would you suggest somebody who's never done this before kind of get you know the impetus to right to jump? yeah i mean i think that's hard because i'm I, i'm an engineer so like you know some people say oh you, you're and you have an engineer brain right so i just walk around you know, and every product that I use, I'm just like, well, this doesn't this doesn't work the way that it should. Or, you know, my credit card falls out of my wallet or whatever it is. I'm constantly just like looking at everything like an unsolved problem. 
So sometimes it's hard for me to like grasp how uh, individuals who walk the earth wouldn't constantly be thinking, how do I just make everything better, right? So, but I, but I think one way of doing that is uh, sometimes we run um, like little workshops, like just one hour workshops over lunch or something where we might get a, f a few folks together that work on common set of problems. It may be people from a particular department or treating a particular type of disease and try to get folks in the room to, to brainstorm around that. Because often one person will say something like, oh, well, this has always been a problem for me. And then everyone will agree, oh yeah, that's a major problem. But then it will just kind of feed that kind of thought process. So that's something that we've done a lot of and that we're really happy to do. I know that you're all tremendously busy, so that can be sometimes difficult to arrange. And we can do that, I said, you know, in a particular department, but often it's it's um, really nice to do around a particular condition or, you know, um, you know, in in the surgical theater, there's a lot of different specialties in there. There's anesthesia and surgeons and different technicians and so forth. And so we might do it something around a particular surgery or something it might be. So I think something like that really gets people thinking and you don't always result from those kinds of workshops with the very best ideas. But it gets everyone thinking about, um, how, you know, how to think in these terms. And sometimes just hearing a talk like the one I gave makes people kind of sit up at night. But I, I also think that, um, you know, instead of just being frustrated that, you know, maybe you're not getting the outcomes that you want from a particular condition or that, you know, parents don't force their kids to, you know, wear their hearing aids or whatever it might be you know, because we recently had a project associated with that, that you just take those frustrations out and you write them down on a piece of paper or just, you know, it's midnight and you're frustrated with a particular patient population and you just submit the project. And then we can follow up and there's no commitment to really participate um, if you don't want to. And you may find that there's a group of your colleagues and you say, well, I can't commit an hour a week over this nine months. But with this group of five colleagues that work on this problem, I think together, collectively, we could probably get an hour a week. And, and we really like teams of clinicians and teams of people that are working on problems to participate. And, and that always can be very successful. So I think it's sometimes hard to think about that. But, um, but uh, you know, it's, I imagine in, in the world that you live in, there are daily frustrations about how, you know, outcomes are. And, and turn those outcomes, you know, those frustrations maybe into into something um, productive. Um, so that's the way I would ask people to think about it. That's great. Thank, thank you so much. I, li I like that idea of together and just thinking mm -hmm. about it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you for the invitation, Leslie. Since nobody's talking, I can ask you another question. Um, okay. What about, um, you know, things like how do you best deal with a, a child who is um, overly aggressive, right? You know, you don't want to restrain them because restraints are terrible. I mean, have you thought mm -hmm. of, have you guys gone through some of those kinds of things? Like what's the best way to uh, create a room or space or, you know, mm -hmm. something that would be um, more comfortable for the the uh, child and uh, safer for the people that work with them. Yeah, this we actually have had uh, a dozen or more projects around, uh, you know, around this general area of restraints, not just for pediatric patients, but just just general area. One of the projects was for adult patients that have delirium in the ICU and, you know, finding ways not to restrain them. Another project uh, I, was submitted this year uh, from someone in ophthalmology from Seattle Children's um, uh, focused on uh, measuring uh, tonometry, so measuring eye pressure. And so, uh, you know, of course, nobody likes getting poked in the eye. And so, um, and it was about um, having actually to uh, sedate the patients to, to measure eye pressure. And so, you know, for example, well, the solution that this project didn't end up going all the way into prototype development. The solution was, you know, kind of like a virtual reality kind of game where the kids could put on a little headset or look through something that was almost like a pair of binoculars and look at something interesting that was engaging and that the eye pressure would be measured during that process. So 
you know, part of it is just finding a way to engage, to reduce pain, to reduce fear. And so, you know, I, I imagine if that's a, if that's a fun experience, the kids are going to be excited about coming to the clinic. Oh, I get to do the virtual reality such and such and find the bunny that's hopping around or whatever it might be. And that's interesting. And they don't even know that they're getting their eyes, uh, you know, their eye pressure measured. So I think that's the type of solution. Now, you know, I know that there are probably cases where it's very difficult to make it fun, but but that is sort of the general approach that we've taken to avoiding kind of restraints. Um, and if that's possible, we would do that. But of course, taking the discomfort and the pain out of healthcare is what, you know, makes them, you know, I have kids of my own and, uh, you know, it, it's very anxiety provoking, you know. And so I think, um, you know, especially if you have repeat care, something that is need, needs to be done regularly, like these eye pressure measurements, uh, finding some ways to engage the kids and have it make fun. I mean, that's why they started giving toys away at the dentist, right? You know, I mean, this is the same approach roughly. But of course, if you're causing pain and discomfort, then then it's a very different um, scenario in that case. Yeah. But that's a good question. And I think we've been able to come up with good solutions for most of those problems. But of course, there may be cases and we, we just simply can't, you know, and there's just going to be discomfort. But um, but most of the time, I think we've come up with some pretty creative solutions to that. Wonderful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hey, Jonathan, um, sure. Dr. Kelly Evans has a great question um, that I appreciate a lot. Uh, she's asking if any projects, um, have you supported any projects? with parents, patients sort of direct involvement and what that might look like. Um, and then sort of the, the segue also uh, just being involved in um, consumer landscapes, but uh, what kind of how patient voices are directly in, in product development as well. Right. I mean, as I've spoken about this sort of need-based um, design process, it's it's very important that we get the voice of the patients and the parents, I mean, especially in pediatrics, um, sort of the social effects and the psychological effects of of getting people engaged and willing to be adherent to to what's being recommended is tremendously important. So, I would say that you know you all are really the connection points to those parents and those patients. And of course, there's HIPAA and privacy and all these kinds of things that that are engaged. And our students actually um, take training for HIPAA, so they're very sort of aware and and acknowledge that. So. You know, ultimately, you're our connection point to that. But um, the most successful projects are really connected to the patients and their parents, and so we we welcome that as much as that that's possible. As projects go sort of towards a later stage, and there's a prototype that um, is low risk, then we we have often had patients um, you know try out some of these technologies. If, if there's like no risk to them, maybe it's like something they listen to or something they look at or something they kind of like try on to their body, but it's, you know, it's not intrusive. So we always try to engage people and as early as possible. Um, but people also have to have an appreciation for the design process and that it takes time and that they're not going to, you know, come in for half an hour and, and tell folks about the problem. And then two weeks later, there's going to be some type of really useful, you know, um, um, device that they can just go in and, and, and practice and use. But, um, even you know that that uh, our devices are not in in commercial use generally. Uh, many of them um, we have IRB. They're being used on patients in a clinical environment or taken home with patients, and so we're really trying to increase the amount of uh, patient and and and, 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 and so. Um, I would say that's really critical to the design process. In some cases, it's easier than than others and engaging patients. But I would say um, for those of you who would like to submit unmet needs, you might consider some of those patients or, and or parents that you've worked with for a long time and try to engage them in this process because it, it will um, be really valuable. Um, yeah, I hope that answers the question. That's a great question. Um, by um, Kelly, so thank you. Are we all getting 10 minutes of our life back here? <laughs>
We might be, but we will use that time to submit our ideas on your website. Yes, exactly. You Homework assignment for everyone <laughs> on the call. Would you mind showing that last slide or telling me the link so I can type it into the chat? Yeah, why don't you type it in? So well, Great. I'll 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 um I'll share my slide and then you can type it in. Okay, perfect. I wanted to write it down too. Okay. Um, so the website is just uh, the letters e i h dot u w dot e d u. That's the best place to go. There's lots of email addresses and everything there. Or you can remember engineering innovation and health. You'll get directly to our website. And then my email is uh, j posner at u w dot e d u. So um, there's lots of ways to reach out to us, and we're very visible on the web. And so, yeah, submit unmet needs. Or if you're sort of like, I want to get involved, but I don't know how. You know, and I don't really know what the unmet needs are. Just reach out, and we'll find a way to engage you in other in someone else's project, or spend some you know half an hour, an hour with you and your colleagues to help try to spur up some of these unmet needs. Because without your unmet needs, we really have no program. So, part of this is a very selfish that we that we need to try to find new mentors and new problems to work on. Awesome. Well, I'm guessing that mailbox is going to fill up. So thank you so much for your time this morning and to sure. all our participants for being here. We really, really appreciate all of your work. And this is very, very cool. So all right. Thank you, Susan. We'll give you the rest of your Thursday morning back. But thanks. And to all our Grand Rounds viewers, we'll see you next week. Thank okay, you so much. Take care, much. everybody. Okay. Bye. Take care. Bye.